Order. The sitting is resumed. It is time for questions to the Minister of Enterprise, Trade and Investment. We will start with listed questions. And I call Mr. Marcin O'Mullier. Kirsty Ahean, I'll ask Concordia question one. Minister. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. My department works closely with Belfast International Airport to encourage new transatlantic routes uh, with business and inbound tourism potential. This support is provided in a number of ways. For example, Tourism Ireland cooperative marketing, marketing support is available for transatlantic services. We also provide practical support for Belfast International Airport and our other airports by taking a stand at the annual World Routes Conference. Another important factor in encouraging transatlantic connectivity has been the decisive action by the Executive to eliminate air passenger duty on direct long-haul flights. Mr. Ramallier. Uh, thank you, uh, Deputy Speaker, and thank you, Minister. Um, I was recently speaking with the Chief Executive of the Belfast International Airport, as we said. I also met the owners of the airport in Toronto, and I met Massport, who run Logan Airport in Boston. Uh, there is definitely interest in a transatlantic flight. Or where we are falling down is that, uh, at the minute, we have no flights out of Belfast. Uh, I wonder if the Minister would agree that now is the time for a concerted and united push by the new owners of the airport, uh, by Tourism Ireland, uh, by the Belfast International Airport itself, plus our many ambassadors, uh, to try and see if we can bring in the number of transatlantic visitors we would like to see, uh, especially given the success of Dublin Airport. The road's a big help, as the Minister knows, but the road goes both ways. Thank you, Minister. Thank you. And thank the member for his question. And I think in his uh, secondary question, he's acknowledging the importance of connectivity for us here in Northern Ireland and the fact that we do need more international flights coming in. We're very pleased that the, the Newark flight uh, continues to be a success, disappointed that it was uh, dropped to 10 months uh, last year instead of 12. Uh, but there is much work to be done. Uh, I acknowledge that. I hope to meet again uh, with some Canadian airlines uh, later on this year. But we are in direct competition uh, with Dublin Airport now, and they have now uh, four direct flights to Canada, uh, and that is causing difficulties for us in relation trying to achieve uh, more connectivity, particularly uh, from North America. I do welcome the increased connectivity to Europe, uh, and um, if things go according to plan, that uh, connectivity will increase uh, this year again, um, and I'm very pleased about that. But we do need to increase uh, the connectivity uh, to North America in particular, and I welcome any uh, offers of help uh, that are out there uh, to help us to try and achieve that. Call Mr. Danny Kinnahan. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her answer. But I wonder um, when will she or will she use all her influence on her colleagues in the executive to help get the international airport its um, enterprise zone with the tax incentive, incentives and the infrastructure and help make that the airport, not just the lead airport in Northern Ireland, but possibly one day the lead airport in the whole of Ireland? I thank the member for his question, and of course, he's referring to. Uh, the new Chief Executive's ambitious plans for the land in and around the International Airport, which I welcome. I know he talks of an enterprise zone, but as yet uh, we have only one uh, area designated by Her Majesty's Treasury for an enterprise zone, and that, of course, is in Coleraine. Uh, there has been no other areas uh, designated as an enterprise zone as yet. Um, of course, we're very happy to work uh, with Graham and his team at the International Airport to market uh, the opportunities that there are for having such close proximity uh, to an international airport, and we will continue to do that. We'll continue to work with Graham and the other airports as well uh, to look at the opportunities that have been presented by uh, the DFT fund that has been made available, the Department of Transport's fund that has been made available for regional connectivity throughout Europe. Uh, this House will know that there has been quite stringent um, guidelines in relation to helping airports to develop their routes. That has been slightly relaxed now, and we're looking forward to encouraging the airports, along with airlines, to bid into that trans Department of Transport fund and to try and bring some of that money to Northern Ireland. Call Mr. David Michael Veen. 
Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her answers so far. The Minister, of course, will not be surprised that I am entirely supportive of the Member for South Belfast sentiment of bringing greater transatlantic connectivity. However, when we look to areas like China, India, Russia, um, areas that we are seeking to do business with, that perhaps we would struggle to encourage direct connectivity from there to Northern Ireland, would the Minister be supportive of the expansion, or proposed expansion of Heathrow Airport, and would she see it as having a, a benefit long term to Northern Ireland's economy as well as the South East? England? Well, I do think that uh, the expansion of Heathrow will bring uh, greater benefits for uh, Northern Ireland in terms of um, because it is that hub uh, for us in the UK. Uh, it's important for us, and I welcome the fact uh, that the British Airways flight now from Belfast uh, goes into Terminal 5 because that then allows uh, the connectivity to happen uh, in an easier way for travellers. And uh, indeed, uh, I flew into Terminal 5 for the first time uh, last week uh, since the changeover, and it was very smooth and easy, even if it was a point to point access to London. Um, so I have uh, written to the airport's uh, commission. Sir Howard Davies came over and he met with both myself and the Minister for Regional Development uh, back in 2013, uh, but I've written to him again to stress the importance of Northern Ireland's connectivity uh, into that UK hub, uh, because of course for us uh, he's absolutely right to stress those onward uh, international travel destinations, which we won't have a direct link into, so we need to be able to access those uh, in as easy a way as possible. Dr. Alistair McDonald. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and could I thank the Minister for her comments so far? And while I too recognise the importance of transatlantic flights, could I ask the Minister what recent discussions she has had, if any, with the government, the British government in London, on reducing air passenger duty rates on short haul flights? Because while long haul flights are important, short haul flights are doubly important. There's a lot more people using the short haul flights, and the cost of those flights is prohibitive in some cases. Thank the member for his question, and he will of course know that the executive was successful uh, in having the devolution of APD for those long haul flights. We actually have a zero rate in terms of the long haul flights, so the flight to America uh, does not attract any air passenger duty. Um, I've had uh, meetings with two airlines in this past two days, and each of them have raised the issues uh, in relation to APD and the, the uh, fact that it is a barrier to growth in terms of UK markets. Uh, and I do say to them, as I will say to you, that I absolutely support them in their campaign to have air passenger duty uh, abolished across the United Kingdom because it is having a disproportionate impact on regional airports outside of London. Uh, London will always have uh, the throughput of traffic coming through, regardless of air passenger duty. But for those of us in regional airports, it does present us with a problem, and therefore we need to continue to push. I welcome the members' um, uh, support to continue to push against air passenger duty, and I will certainly be raising it with the government in the future. Call Mr. Patsy McGlone for a question. Uh, question number two. Uh, ultimately, it will be for the Northern Ireland Executive to agree on what any new rate should be set at. Uh, the push for the devolution of corporation tax powers has tended to be viewed with a perceived move to a rate of 12.5 per cent, and as a result, discussions on the block grant adjustment for a reduced rate have also tended to focus on the public finance consequences of moving to 12.5 per cent rate. An even lower rate of corporation tax would require a bigger adjustment to public finances, but would also be more attractive to investors. Mr. McGloan, for a supplementary. Uh, uh, thanks very much. Uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I, I guess we have slash and I come away, and my thanks to, to the Minister as well. But uh, given that the Minister had introduced the notion of the 10 per cent, the reduction to 10 per cent, uh, what costings were made around that uh, as to what actually that further reduction might cost in monetary terms and its potential impact upon the block grant as a consequence? Well, I'm, I'm very pleased to hear that the member thinks I introduced the uh, concept of a 10 per cent rate. It wasn't me. I'd like to take the credit for that, but it wasn't me that introduced uh, that. That has been DUP party policy for quite some time uh, in relation uh, to the rate of corporation tax, because we believe that we should undercut our nearest competitor uh, instead of going to the same level as our nearest competitor. But I'm a realist. I understand that the executive takes the decision in relation to corporate tax. Uh, and. Uh, 
If you were to ask me where I think it will settle, I understand that it will settle in and around 12.5 per cent. The lower rate, of course, uh, would bring us uh, more potential for more jobs, uh, but it would cost more to the public finances. There's no point in saying otherwise. So again, that has to be taken into consideration as well. Uh, so I believe that we will settle in and around 12.5 per cent, Mr Deputy Speaker, but of course that is a matter for the executive as a whole. And Mr. Gordon Dunn. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And, uh, <coughs> I think it's right that we welcome the Minister back from her travels, selling Northern Ireland to Dubai. And I think we all recognise the excellent work she does and the energy and commitment she puts into it. As there is no doubt that the rate of cooperation tax will be an additive incentive to attract new companies into Northern Ireland, does the Minister believe that companies will be attracted in advance of the rate being reduced? Well, some of the work that has been carried out by the Northern Ireland Centre for Economic Policy points to the fact that we will see a benefit, albeit a small benefit, before the rate uh, is actually reduced. And that is because we intend to, once the rate has been settled by the Northern Ireland Executive and the date for implementation has been settled as well, uh, Invest Northern Ireland will, will start competing then uh, for those no, new types of jobs. And it may be the case. Uh, that some of those companies might like to uh, relocate or set up a new uh, business in Northern Ireland before the actual rate uh, kicks in. Uh, that's because uh, business plans and investments normally are set two to three years in advance, so we should have a clear view as to which companies are going to come uh, in that first year if we get out and start selling the rate and the date in the near future. Call Mr Phil Flanagan. I thank the Minister for her answers um, so far. Can I ask her whether she is advocating a, a proposition similar to that of the, the Smith Commission in Scotland, which, says, which talks about the, the local retention of any increased um, tax take as a result of a, a change in, in local policy and corporation tax? Well, of course, we're going to gain from the corporate tax take because we are paying for it through our block grant. So we will gain the benefit from uh, whatever increase in corporation tax we get. Obviously, there will be a cost initially. Um, and uh, that will not come in all in one year. It will be tapered up to 2020, uh, that cost. But that's why we need to get out and start uh, getting the benefits of a lower rate of corporation tax as soon as possible. Call Mrs. Sandra Overend. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, does the Minister recognise that the issue is not just about uh, matching or undercutting the, the Republic's rate, but rather does the Minister agree that there is a need to ensure that Northern Ireland has a full basket of measures, including uh, to accompany the lower rate of corporation tax, including a super skilled workforce and a major expansion of A grade office accommodation? I thank the member for her question, and I have never uh, indicated that it is corporate tax alone that will bring uh, a more sustainable economy and give us that growth of 10 to 12 per cent that we believe will happen uh, if we have a lower rate of corporation tax. That will only happen if we have the correct infrastructure in place, uh, be that telecoms, be that hard infrastructure, in other words, road infrastructure, uh, be that the skills, the softer infrastructure that we need, uh, or indeed uh, that we have uh, the appropriate messaging going out as well, because we want to send out a very positive message about Northern Ireland as a place to invest in and to do business in. And whilst we've always had a, a very talented workforce here in Northern Ireland, as I've said on many occasions, we now have the tax proposition as well. So we have tax and talent, and we must concentrate on that messaging and get it out across the world. Call Mr Alex Atwood for a question. Uh, question number three. Ultimately, uh, it will be for the Northern Ireland Executive to agree on what any new rate should be set at. Uh, research to date has focused on moving to a reduced rate of 12.5 per cent and demonstrates the significant economic benefits this can bring, not just in, in encouraging foreign investment but also for uh, local firms. An even lower rate of corporation tax would likely be more attractive to investors but would also require a bigger adjustment to the public finances. Call Mr Atwood for a supplement. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. In your last uh, question, you rightly referred to the talent of our people in terms of their skills, a point recognised last week by one of our entrepreneurs who acknowledged that because of the skills in Belfast, it had now become a digital, digital capital. 
Do, does the Minister recognise that on the far side of any reduction in corporation tax, there is a risk that regional imbalance will be compounded as businesses are attracted to Belfast because of the cluster of talent in Belfast, which may not be in other parts of Northern Ireland? Do you recognise that as a risk which is proven by international experience? And would you outline how that risk might be mitigated? I thank the member for raising that issue, and he will know that capital cities will always be different from the different regions around, and that's recognised in the Republic of Ireland, it's recognised uh, in the rest of the United Kingdom as well. Uh, to his risk point in relation to skills, that is why we must have very strong higher and further educational um, uh, colleges right across Northern Ireland and that they are aware of their skills base, what they need to grow their skills base, how they can develop to have a unique selling point for their own regional area. I don't think that every regional area should go after the same type of jobs because then it will become uh, a race to the bottom. So therefore, it is important that everybody identifies their own unique selling point. And this is a discussion uh, that we're starting to have in the Executive Subcommittee on Regional Opportunities, uh, which has met for the first time since that meeting. I've had a very good engagement uh, with Londonderry City uh, Chamber of Commerce and indeed many other players in the North West to try and find out what it is they feel their unique selling point is and I hope that that will be replicated uh, around Northern Ireland so that we can have differences across Northern Ireland but very strongly sending out a message of talent and tax. Call Mr George Robinson for supplementary. <coughs> Mr Deputy Speaker, <coughs> could I thank the Minister for her answer so far? Does the Minister believe that we have sufficient skills within the Northern Ireland workforce, especially in my East London area constituency, to attract more foreign and direct investment into Northern Ireland? Skills are, are vital um, to attracting high value foreign direct investment and uh, our workforce is a key part of that and it's what makes us uh, actually a very successful story in terms of foreign direct investment as regards the United Kingdom. Uh, but now that we have uh, corporation tax or well, we will have corporation tax as a tool in our box, we need to further implement that tax and talent message and that will happen not just uh, in uh, East Londonderry but right across Northern Ireland. But it is a collaborative effort, I have to say, Mr Deputy Speaker, that needs to be taken on not just by Invest Northern Ireland but by other uh, members of the executive uh, to look at the whole picture of what uh, it is a constituency has to offer uh, and as well as that uh, to work with the local super councils and Invest Northern Ireland uh, are more proactively working with the new chief executives of the super councils now, uh, certainly down to the fact that uh, uh, they are having devolved, uh, for example, regional uh, support initiatives which are being devolved down to the local councils. Uh, so there will be more economic powers for the local councils as well. So it is a collaborative effort and I look forward to working uh, with councils right across Northern Ireland. Call Ms Claire Sugden. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker. Um, I didn't intend to quote the Minister's response, but here goes. Um, does the Minister agree that along with corporation tax, Project Kelvin and the imminent enterprise zone, it will create a global unique selling point uh, for Northern Ireland, which happens to be in my constituency in Corian? Yes, and I hope that um, the lower corporation tax will uh, actually say to local areas to look at what they have to offer, how can they package that together and market it, and how can they make it better. And of course, she's right to mention Project Kelvin, because Project Kelvin is an absolutely fabulous uh, story to tell, uh, particularly uh, to our American uh, counterparts, so that they know that they can have information, leave Northern Ireland to get the east coast of America quicker than it can get from the east coast of America to the west coast of America. And that's a fabulous story uh, to tell. So I hope that that's the sort of collaborative thinking that will go on right across Northern Ireland. Call Mr. Daffy Mackay for a question. Okay, so very Cahar, question number four. Invest Northern Ireland continues to support job creation, business growth and investment in North Antrim. Between 1 April 2011 and 30 March 2013, it made 661 offers of support to companies in North Antrim, offering £14 million of assistance, which contributed to total investment in the constituency of over £70 million. This has led to the promotion of 848 new jobs in the area. Invest collaborates with local stakeholders to review the features and benefits of North Antrim to maximise opportunities to secure additional jobs. Mr Mackay for supplementary. Thank you, Minister, for her answer. And, uh, 
Would the Minister agree with me that, in terms of Invest in A, uh, it could be a lot better for North Antrim, especially in comparison with constituencies uh, around Belfast? Uh, but will she also uh, agree that to, to arrest the decline, North Antrim and indeed Ballymena should be prioritised, given what we've seen? Uh, in regard to jobs at Patton's that are going, uh, the job jo- that have gone, jobs uh, at Gallagher's that are going as well. Does the Minister agree that North Antrim needs to be a priority area for investment? Well, I hope that every area is a priority area for Invest Northern Ireland. And indeed, uh, if he looks at the figures, uh, and I, I, I do implore colleagues that when they're looking at uh, economic, in- uh, in- uh, economic activity in their area, that they don't just look at uh, jobs created through foreign direct investment, but jobs created through uh, local indigenous companies and indeed startups uh, in their own area. And in North Antrim, um, they have had a huge amount of startups over a period of time, 1,554 uh, startups. That's 178 indigenous startups per 10,000 of a population. So that shows a very entrepreneurial spirit uh, in North Antrim. And uh, indeed, the unemployment rate is one of the lower rates in Northern Ireland, sitting at 3.6% um, as opposed to the Northern Ireland rate of 5.7%. So I'm sure he would want to be positive uh, about his constituency and what it has to offer. Well, Mr Jim Allister for supplementary. Uh, could I quote the minister, minister some other figures which come from her in answer to uh, Assembly questions? North Antrim in the last fi- five years, eight foreign direct investment visits. North Antrum in 2014, the latest year with figures, the low, one of the lowest levels of Invest NI contribution, 1.9% of the whole of what was invested in Northern Ireland. North uh, Antrim in the last sorry, three years, remember, 574 new jobs compared with 1,310 in the Minister's constituency. Why is she not playing fair by North Antrim? Well, again, I do say to you, Deputy Speaker, that members need to look at the whole picture when they're looking at their own and not picking out statistics that suit their own negative agenda. And it is disappointing that members don't want to be positive about their own area because, you know, when foreign direct investors look at an area, they actually look at what their own... They actually look at what their own uh, representatives are saying about their area, and this is true not just for North Antrim, but indeed for other areas in Northern Ireland. So if there's a negativity coming out of that particular area, they will know uh, that the people are not pro-business, that they don't want to move ahead, and that they are looking at the negative points in their constituency. And actually, he needs to look at all of the statistics in relation to North Antrim, and not just some. Order, please. I do have to remind members on both sides of the House and at the back of the House not to be making remarks from a sedentary position. And I call Mr. Paul Free. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And whilst other representatives of North Antrim play the area down, I most certainly will play the area up. And we have some great indigenous companies in North Antrim and throughout County Antrim, of course, which benefits all of our constituents. Uh, can I ask the Minister what she is doing? to help those companies uh, to grow and to find new export markets outside of Northern Ireland. And I think the emphasis should be on looking to those new export markets for our indigenous companies, and that's why we do spend uh, a lot of our time uh, looking for new markets, bringing companies to us through two new markets and uh, just today whilst uh, it's not a company from County Antrim it is a company not too far away SDC Trailers uh, announced that they were doing very significant business in Saudi Arabia and that's a very good uh, uh, pointer to other firms that they need to get out into these markets and to sell into the markets because that brings jobs uh, to the local area and I've seen that happen obviously with Rightbus which is a a stellar company in the members constituency uh, with Ram Docks next door uh, in South Antrim, uh, who recently announced 540 new jobs for the area. And that, of course, isn't just for the town of Antrim, although they would very much welcome it, but for the wider area uh, as well. So there is some very good news in terms of Indigenous companies in Northern Ireland. Call Mr Gregory Campbell for a question. Number, whatever the number five. Uh, International events such as the Irish Open and Giro d'Italia attract large numbers of visitors, showcase Northern Ireland on a global stage and give us the opportunity to drive further visitor numbers through the positive perception these events create. 
Tourism Northern Ireland has successfully used major events to profile Northern Ireland as a visitor destination through award-winning marketing campaigns. However, marketing and promotion is just one aspect. In order to grow visitor numbers and, more importantly, visitor spend, we need to ensure we invest in the product offering, develop, or, uh, develop visitor-inspired experiences, and increase the capacity and competitiveness of our tourism industry. These are key work streams for Tourism Northern Ireland, who will continue to successfully use global iconic events as a catalyst for tourism development and growth. Well, Mr. Campbell for supplementary. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Nothing like being prepared. Uh, um, the Minister will be aware that the Open is uh, due to come uh, to Royal Port Rush in the next few years and hopefully it will be a very successful event for all of Northern Ireland. Would she plan on not just preparation for the Open, which I know is well underway, but for the success that would follow such a magnificent event? Yes, absolutely. And uh, I think it's uh, appropriate uh, when the member asked me a question that I do mark today uh, the passing of one of tourism's great ambassadors uh, in Northern Ireland, Martin McCross. And let me, Deputy Speaker, pass on my deepest sympathy to Martin's wife, Sharon, and his family. Uh, he was a, a great ambassador in the member city. Uh, and who brought many tours uh, around the city's walls, and uh, we will miss him dreadfully uh, from tourism in Northern Ireland. In terms of the open work has already uh, begun, uh, in terms of the infrastructure, and indeed uh, we have some money set aside in the budget this year uh, for infrastructure works. That will continue, uh, and then we will be looking to build on that. And I hope it's not a one-off. Um, I say, Mr Campbell, I do hope that it's uh, the start of us being on the rota uh, for a good number of years, and I have every confidence that Royal Portrush will be able to deliver that. Call Mrs Karen McKevitt for supplement. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. And as the Minister well knows, um, uh, on an, on an all-island basis, when you're trying to attract the like of sporting tourism, etc., into areas, particularly around South Down, uh, where a fine example is going to happen now in May, but the lack of bed space and the availability of bed space in order to attract major events is a huge problem. And can I ask the Minister, um, what will Invest NI be doing to try and open up investment for those looking to um, bring extra uh, bed space to, uh, in particular the like of South Down? Well, as the member knows, um, Invest Northern Ireland deal with the tourism accommodation grants and of course they are ready uh, and willing to work with any private sector company that comes uh, forward in terms of a tourism uh, accommodation programme. Uh, unfortunately, there haven't been any to date and I did notice uh, that uh, my ministerial colleague has uh, been doing some work in and around Port Rush in relation to tourism accommodation. I haven't had the opportunity to speak to him in relation to whether he intends to look elsewhere as well, but maybe that's something that she would like to follow up with him. Call Mr Tom Elliott. Uh, question number six, Deputy Speaker. The G8 Summit provided Northern Ireland with the opportunity to reach a new and diverse global audience with an entirely new message about Northern Ireland, its people, landscape and economy. The benefits associated with an event such as the G8 Summit are focused on increased investment, tourism and trade opportunities that the global exposure might present. Northern Ireland immediately capitalised on the exposure generated by the G8 Summit by hosting a very successful investment conference in October of 2013. I was also encouraged to note in the final evaluation report that 71 per cent of the Northern Ireland tourism industry believe that the G8 will impact positively on the future growth of tourism in Northern Ireland. Call Mr Elliott for supplementary. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker, and I thank the, the Minister for that update. Uh, prior to the G8 coming to Fermanagh, was the Minister given any assurances about improvements to uh, mobile telecommunications? And if so, was that borne out after the G8 was over? Uh, well, we were given um, the assurance that the, during the event that there would be the appropriate telecoms in place to deal with such a major event because one thing we wanted to ensure was that uh, people didn't leave the event feeling that they were in a backwater and they weren't able to use the telecoms uh, there and that worked very well indeed. Uh, through BT and other providers. Uh, I have been uh, somewhat disappointed uh, by the level of infrastructure left after the G8 summit. Uh, I'm hoping that the uh, mobile infrastructure project, which of course is a national project, will enhance uh, that coverage again. But we keep a very close eye in relation to that project to make sure it delivers for us. Order. That ends the period for listed questions. We will now move on 
to topical questions, and I call Mr. Jonathan Craig. Mr. Craig. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Minister, uh, I want to ask you a question around the rollout of the high-speed uh, broadband in Northern Ireland. And I would like to start by congratulating the Minister on its rollout in Lagan Valley, where we have seen uh, 400 homes increased uh, in my own locality in Anahilt and a further 200 in uh, the Temple area. More importantly, 20 businesses are now competing on an international level. Will the Minister give the House an update on the increased rollout across Northern Ireland? as this does make rural businesses competitive, not only on a national but an international stage. Thank the member for his question and uh, indeed for letting me know that he wanted to address this issue today because I think it is important that I give uh, the House an update in relation uh, to the uh, broadband improvement project. Uh, the project has been delivered in eight phases. Uh, with the objective of providing basic fixed line broadband services of at least 2 megabits per second in areas that previously has a, have had no service uh, and improvements in the availability of superfast uh, fixed line broadband as well. By 31 December last year, over 17,500 premises had benefited uh, from the improvements being delivered. Uh, the project is on track to deliver benefits for 30,000 premises by the 31st of March of this year. And we're anticipating that in excess of 45,000 premises will have benefited by the completion as of the 31st of December 2015. So it's been a good intervention in terms of trying to help those people who haven't to date been able to access uh, the appropriate level of broadband support. Mr. Craig, for supplementary. Yep. I thank the minister very much for that answer, and it has indeed uh, been very, very successful. I can testify myself, 148 four, uh, uh, fourfold increase in my own internet speed, so thank you, Minister. Um, what impact does the Minister actually believe this will have on rural businesses in particular? I am aware of uh, five, <laughs> five businesses in particular now in my own locality, which is now doing international business because of this connection. Do you feel that this will have a benefit to other businesses in other rural localities? <laughs> Such as East Antrim, uh, yes. East Antrim. Yeah. Um, I do think that this will have, uh, obviously we pride ourselves on being able to do business across the world, but to be able to do that we have to have a presence online and I have been to many small businesses that are growing at a very fast rate and it's down to the fact of their telecoms infrastructure. So when I talk uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, about infrastructure and the need for good infrastructure across Northern Ireland. I don't just talk about roads infrastructure, although that is critically important, of course. I talk about also telecoms infrastructure because it is important that we communicate with the rest of the world, and we're hoping that this will enable many businesses to do so. Call Mr. Jimmy Spratt for a topical question. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. And from pigeons uh, to the creative industries, uh, would the Minister join with me in congratulating the cre creative industries in Northern Ireland, and in particular those who have had major success in recent days? Uh, well, let me very much uh, send my congratulations, first of all, uh, to those uh, behind Boogaloo and Graham. And from what I've seen of the two chickens, I very much want to see the rest of the uh, film in their success uh, at the BAFTA Awards for Best Short Film on, on Sunday. Uh, a tremendous endorsement of the creative industries here in Northern Ireland, and I understand uh, the short film has also been nominated for an Oscar at the Academy Awards. And then just today we learned that 16 South, um, which is a Belfast-based animation company, has won a television award as well uh, for its preschool children's series, Lily's Driftwood Bay. And they took the best preschool program category in the American Broadcast Awards this week. So a tremendous endorsement, an international endorsement of our creative industries here in Northern Ireland. Mr. Spratt, for supplementary. Thank you, Minister, uh, for that answer. And can I ask you, will you continue to work with the industry uh, to make sure that there's continued success in this area? Well, absolutely, because, of course, Boogaloo and Graham was funded by Northern Ireland Screen. Uh, Northern Ireland Screen uh, is a uh, Invest Northern Ireland is the single largest funder of Northern Ireland Screen, and uh, he will probably be aware of the fact that we did uh, last year, in last March, um, 
launch the strategy for Northern Ireland Screen, which is called Opening Doors. And, uh, through that, uh, we intend to continue to grow our creative industries for the sector itself and also for the tourism benefits that we receive from the creative sector. Uh, I will, of course, make mention of the Game of Thrones impact on the tourism sector, and that continues to grow month on month, and I very much welcome that. Call Mr. Sammy Wilson for a topical question. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, unlike the member for Lagan Valley and parts of East Antrim, broadband is something which is unheard of. In fact, maybe you'd be quicker sending messages by shooting them by elastic band uh, than using uh, uh, broadband. Could the minister tell us, first of all, what money she has made available through her department to BT? to improve broadband um, and fibre optic cables across Northern Ireland? Uh, I'm sorry to tell the member I don't have the total amount here, but I will of course write them with the total amount that we have uh, funded because we have made a number of interventions uh, over my time uh, in terms of the telecoms infrastructure, in terms of the broadband infrastructure. And I know he's frustrated in relation uh, to some of the areas in East Antrim, but the Northern Ireland Broadband Infrastructure Project will roll out uh, across East Antrim as well. It may not be in the early stages uh, of the project, but as I indicated, there are eight phases to the project, uh, and therefore it may be that he's at a later stage. Call Mr. Wilson for a supplement. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. When she is looking at how the programme will roll out in the future, we should be cognizant, first of all, that there are eight industrial areas in Northern Ireland, um, enterprise zone or estates, etc., which currently don't have access to fibre optic uh, broadband, and indeed many rural um, industries and many rural firms who don't have access, which really stops and prevents their expansion. And will she ensure that BT gives some uh, priority to these kinds of areas and these kinds of activities? Well, I, I can't force BT uh, to acknowledge that because they're a commercial organisation, but in terms of the contract under which they operate for government funding, yes, we can certainly encourage them uh, to look at those areas. I have actually, he's right to mention the industrial parks because I think that we need to look at our industrial parks to make sure that we have uh, the correct telecoms infrastructure there, roads infrastructure, electricity infrastructure is another uh, area which I think we very much need to look at in terms of our industrial parks to make sure that if a company is coming to invest in an area, and this is a big issue, if a company is in coming to invest in an area and it doesn't have the appropriate level of electricity supply, that can put somebody off very much so from investing in an area. So that is another issue uh, that we need to look at. And I've been talking to Invest Northern Ireland as to how we can bring all of those issues together uh, and try to address them. Call Mrs. Dolores Kelly for a topical question. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker. And I hate to labour the issue of rural broadband, but it is a big issue in my area. And uh, the member of Lagan, uh, for Lagan Valley would share part of the Ahali area with me, and I'm sure he's well aware that uh, in Ahali, Ahigal, and Birches and Mahri, many of the rural areas, the broadband continues to be uh, very poor. So, Minister, how is customer satisfaction measured in relation to uh, the supply of rural broadband? Well, often by members addressing me in this house uh, in relation to their constituents uh, reflecting back that they don't have the appropriate level. Look, I think we've come a long way in terms of broadband in Northern Ireland. We're often held out in terms of the UK as an exemplary region as to how uh, broadband has been rolled out. But as we reach those harder to reach areas, it will become more and more difficult to provide uh, the service that those people want. And often it's not about, and I did have an instance in my own constituency uh, where a business was located very close to the motorway actually but because they were uh, attached to a different cabinet than the cabinet just up the road it meant that they were not getting the appropriate speed so often it's a re-engineering solution uh, that's needed and um, specifically to go to BT and to ask them about which cabinet that the, uh, the customer is uh, connected to so again I'm happy to have any conversations or receive any representations in respect of that. Well, Mrs. Kelly for supplementary. Um, I welcome uh, the Minister's uh, commitment to hear our concerns, but could the Minister maybe outline how is the contract monitored and whether or not there are any penalties to be incurred by the uh, uh, successful contractor, which I believe is BT? Well, they have to provide the appropriate level uh, of um, internet speed to a, a certain amount of houses 
so that it, it's a black and white issue if they don't um, uh, supply internet speeds to that level. That's why I'm, I'm talking about figures in terms of my answer to Mr Craig about the number of houses that will be connected and the number of businesses. So uh, that's how it's monitored. And uh, uh, I, I can accept uh, that the member is frustrated in relation to pockets in her own constituency, but as I say, I'm happy to discuss those with her. Call Mr Rob Newton for topical question. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and thank the Minister for her answers so far. Given, Minister, that the number of, of hotels in Northern Ireland in general and the quality of the hotels in Northern Ireland has seen significant increase uh, on what's offered to the tourist and the business community, would the Minister confirm if she believes there is still room for additional hotel space in the Belfast area? Well, I do believe that there uh, is still room, uh, and indeed the market believes that as well, because I think there are a number of developers looking um, at hotel opportunities in the Belfast area. Currently, there are 29 hotels in the Belfast City Council area, uh, and if you go to Greater Belfast, it's probably uh, more than that, uh, providing uh, over 6,500 uh, rooms. Uh, and uh, we would like to encourage more hotel spaces. Obviously, we've had the benefit of uh, not having uh, over-provision uh, which was experienced in the Republic of Ireland, and I think that that is good because now that we're in a more stable environment, we can have sustainable growth, and I certainly hope that that's what happened. Mr. Newton, for supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, would the Minister confirm if there is still general interest in that iconic building where Titanic was uh, designed, known as the Harland and Wolf Drawing Offices, and the potential to convert it into a hotel? Well, yes, I understand that there is still. Uh, potential there and um, uh, an application has been made to the Heritage Lottery Fund uh, for £5 million. Uh, that's towards the restoration of the historic building uh, and conversion into uh, a boutique hotel and negotiations are underway between the private sector uh, regarding the remainder of the money and that would really open up that building because unfortunately the building at the moment uh, is only accessible as part of a walking tour or an organised event. So it would be marvellous to see uh, that building opened up to, to the public so that we could benefit from the fabulous heritage and indeed architecture in the building. Mr. Raymond McCartney for a topical question. Uh, uh, I'm just wondering if the Minister, and I know she, she may have been away in the last couple of days, but uh, the Chief Executive of INI had a very successful, very constructive meeting in Terry last Friday. And we had a, a wide-ranging discussion about the corporate plan as it goes forward. I'm just wondering what, how she believes a sub-regional business development and job creation will inform that corporate plan as we go forward. Well, the um, Chief Executive was following up on a, a very successful visit I'd had to the city uh, a couple of weeks beforehand, uh, where I met with business leaders, and I was very impressed with the very positive approach that they were taking to developing the region. And they, of course, were welcoming the fact that we had set up a subcommittee of the executive to look at regional opportunities. Uh, and I think that that's going to be a good vehicle, not just for Invest Northern Ireland and my own department, but indeed for a, a number of other departments, um, particularly in relation to infrastructure. Structure and skills. Mr. McCartney, for supplement. Thank you very much, Deputy Speaker. And can I thank the Minister for that answer? And indeed, we would all share the, the importance of the, the ministerial subgroup. But I'm just wondering, in terms of tackling you know, regional disparity, does she believe that sub regional approach will be the way forward as, as we take it forward? Well, I think the, the new opportunity that has been provided to us by the Super Councils will provide us with an opportunity to look at 11 uh, parts of Northern Ireland and to, to look at their plans. Obviously, it will be part of their new community plans as to how they wish to see uh, their area develop in terms of the economy. And because of that, there will be more collaboration between Invest Northern Ireland. And I, I do make the plea again to members to uh, work proactively with their council, work proactively with Invest Northern Ireland, and have a unique selling point uh, for their own particular which we can then sell across the world and bring in more investors to see. Call Mr. Alistair Ross for topical questions. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I was wondering if the Minister would update the House on her recent uh, trade mission to the Middle East. 
Well, the trade mission was a, a hugely successful one. We had uh, a number of companies out with us for Arab Health, which is a very large uh, trade promotion in relation to the health industry. We also were there with Queen's University signing an important contract with Dubai Healthcare City uh, to allow Queen's University uh, to develop uh, the Dubai Healthcare City campus. And I think that's going to be really fundamental uh, for that area. Uh, we also took the opportunities to work with some of the other sectors, the food sectors, and as I've already indicated, uh, the manufacturing sector through SDC trailers. So a hugely successful trip, and I was very pleased with the number of people on it. I'm afraid time is up. It's beaten us to